Uh, good morning. A uh, warm welcome to church this morning. It's lovely to see you all. It's uh, lovely to see lots of regulars. It's lovely to see uh, uh, new people, people here for the first time. It's lovely to see Fullerton family. I look forward to uh, Peter sharing from the scriptures uh, later on. As we uh, come to worship, though, let's come and pray and ask for God to be with us and to help us. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we come together, we gather together this morning, uh, knowing that we gather in your presence, knowing that we gather uh, because you have commanded us to, knowing that we gather in order to worship you and to learn from you. And we ask, Father, that you would be at work among us. We pray, Lord, that in everything that is done, in everything that's said, everything that's sung, everything prayed, we ask that you would be honored and glorified. Father, would you be exalted among us? Ask, Father, that you would minister to us as well. You are the only one. You know the week we've had, you know the mornings we've had. You know how we're feeling. And more importantly, Father, you know uh, what we need. And so we ask for those who need encouraged, would you lift them up? Um, for those who need rebuked, would you correct them? Uh, for those who just need to spend time with you, we ask that they would be aware. We would be aware of your presence with us this morning. Father, in everything that's done, would you be honored and glorified, and would we be blessed? We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our opening hymn exalts the Lord Jesus. It's crown him with many crowns, and we'll stand to sing as the music starts. have the slides up where we've been uh, doing a new series in the kids talks although this is a, now the third week so you've been following through and we've been looking at the motto of the or the the vision of the church why we exist or how we think we will serve God here in Yoker and it is that Yoker Evangelical Church makes disciples of Jesus Christ by growing and going 
I did well to remember it, didn't I, when I wasn't on the wall. On the wall. Uh, York Green Evangelical Church exists to make disciples by growing and going disciples of the Lord Jesus. And we were looking at the different things. So over the whole of it, uh, Gordon helped us to see uh, that it comes from Jesus' command to his disciples in, in, the, sermon, in the Great Commission. And then we want to see that actually we, we obey it in lots of different areas with lots of different people. So last week we were looking at the fact that we have to grow ourselves in our relationship with God. That as Christians we're, we're born again and we, we start off new life in Christ and we have to grow up to maturity. But then the second one I want us to see is that we don't just have responsibility for ourselves, which is a lovely thing. And it's one of the reasons why it's so important to gather together at church. Because it's not just that you are responsible for your relationship with God, but it's actually that we are all responsible for one another to help each other to grow in our relationship with God. So the second one is grow one another. You see that? Grow. Yes, Michael. Excellent. So growing and going, grow to growing one another. Now, I wanted to ask you, in life, so normal things, how do you uh, learn stuff? How do you grow in understanding different things? We we'll go on to the next slide, but only press it once. What helps you learn? School? Yeah, okay, so what happens at school that helps you to learn? So what does the teacher do? Teaches, yeah. One of the things that we often need to learn is when somebody actually teaches us something, isn't it? Someone who knows something that we don't know tells us what that is, and then we learn it. Yeah? Brilliant. Someone else? What's that? Books. Yeah, so that would be another form of, of teaching. That's just that the person that's teaching you is not there. They've just written the things in a, in a book, and then you can learn it from that. Well done, yeah. How about if you're doing something Yeah. Okay, so that's still teaching. So the teaching is one of the things. Now, think about if you're doing something wrong. What do you need to learn? Correction. Yeah. If you're any of you are naughty, Sheila will correct you. Uh, you need correction, don't you? If you're doing something wrong, you need someone to go, don't do that. That's the wrong thing to do. If you see a wee, bit, uh, wee kid going towards the fire going, ooh, then you go, no, don't do that. You need to teach them, correct them. That's not the right thing to do. If you see a child putting uh, their mum's jewellery into the bin, they need correction. Yeah? We all need correction. And actually, we get correction as we grow up all the time. Your parents are the best at it. When you do the wrong thing, they say, no, don't do that, do this. That's one of the ways that we learn. There's one other way that we learn. Uh, this is probably the one that's most difficult. Can anyone think? Failure. Well, Yes. Actually, we can, we can make that work, right? <laughs> so we learn from failure. But what happens if you fail and people go, I, you are rubbish? What happens then? You don't do it again. You go, oh, I'm rubbish. What happens if you fail and someone goes, it's all right. I failed the first time I did that as well. Try again. If someone encourages you, then we start to learn, don't we? We have another go and have another go and have another go until we can do it. So we flick them up, I think they're all there. Teaching, correction, encouraging. Now I wanted to look at a verse from the Bible that teaches us that actually the exact same thing happens in the church. We don't just learn and grow by ourselves, but we do it for one another. We, we teach one another. That's one of my jobs as the pastor, and that, along with the elders, is to, to teach. This is one of the jobs that the Sunday school teachers have for you guys when you go through the backs, to teach you, to teach you about who God is, to teach you about what he's done. But then also to correct you. It's one of the things that the church is given to do is to correct one another. Uh, the elders, yes, but also everybody. That as, as brothers and sisters, we're, we're called to correct one another. When we see someone doing something that God wouldn't want, we say, no, that's not the way to go. That's not the way that Jesus has commanded us to live. Do it this way instead. And then encouraging, lifting one another up, helping each other always. Uh, not pushing each other down, squashing one another, but saying, let's go, let's do this together. It's wonderful. Now, if we flick up the next verse, oh, there we go. Um, the, let's, can we read it together? So this is the verse for this um, phrase. It says, he is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom 
so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. Okay, I wanted just to flick through it really quickly. So the, what's the goal? One flick, one click. The goal is that we see everyone fully mature in Christ. So mature means like grown up and, and totally developed. We want everyone fully mature in Christ, everyone to, to grow up into Christ, to be like Jesus. That's the goal. And it's not just for me. It's not just for one of you. It's for all of us, everyone to grow up, to be fully mature in Christ. So that's the goal. Secondly, how do we do it? Yes. Oh, okay. So, and we do that by proclaiming Jesus. It, uh, there's an extra step in there that I'd forgotten about. We do it by proclaiming Jesus, by teaching who uh, Jesus is, all the things that he has done, all the things that he is, um, because he is the one who, who helps us to mature and grow. And then we do it by admonishing and teaching everyone. Now, does anyone know what the word admonishing means? Or can anyone have a guess? What do you think? Any of the adults? Correct, telling off. Um, admonishing is just a posh word for te correcting, telling off. Admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom. And the reason why I think it says with all wisdom is because sometimes you need to know what the best thing is. Because sometimes somebody needs corrected and you encourage them. And actually that doesn't help them. Or maybe they need encouraged and you correct them, which actually is just like giving them a slap. So we need real wisdom to know how we uh, proclaim Jesus and admonish and teach everyone. So we need that wisdom so that we can build one another up so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. So that's, I want us to go through these different things week by week, look at all the different things because it makes up all of what we want to do as a church. And this morning, I want us to go home just thinking about as Yoker Evangelical Church wanting uh, to grow one another, to see each other grow up uh, into full maturity in Christ. Let's pray together. Um, Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for how it's, it speaks of Jesus, teaches us about who he is and all that he has done. But Father, we thank you as well for, for the church, that you have united Christians together in a body so that with different gifts we can minister to each other and help each other to grow into full maturity, to know uh, full maturity in Christ. So Lord, please would you help us, young and old, uh, to keep growing and most importantly, to grow uh, one another. So be with us, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing together uh, a, a song, Jesus Strong and Kind, and it's just reminding us that we always want to run to Jesus, to point each other uh, to Jesus all through days, weeks, months and years. Let's stand and sing together.
Um, if you're between the age of zero and primary seven, then there's crash and Sunday school. Um, if you follow the crowds, you would uh, find your way. And so if you'd like to go out to Sunday school, uh, please do. Just a few uh, notices in the life of the church. Um, after the service, there's tea and coffee, uh, an opportunity for us to practice uh, proclaiming Jesus to one another and teaching and admonishing and helping each other to grow into maturity in Christ. So if you're able, uh, please do stay uh, for tea and coffee and chat to each other. Um, before the service, we always pray as elders, and, and Gordon prayed uh, asking that we wouldn't go into uh, trivial conversations. I don't know what he would deem a trivial conversation, but but just to, to get to know one another properly, um, try and make the effort, uh, even although sometimes we're tired, sometimes we can't be bothered, sometimes we're scared, uh, but to get to know one another so that we can minister uh, to each other. Um, hopefully as you came in, you picked up a, a weekly sheet that tells you the different things uh, that are on in the week ahead. A um, couple of things just to note. The 5 p.m. service this evening, we're starting a new series in the book of Acts. Um, Acts is a very, very, very long book, and so we will be in it for a while. We might take a couple of breaks uh, as we're going through it, but um, starting this new series. And so if you haven't been before to the 5 p.m., it's a good opportunity to come. Um, if you do come regularly, make sure you're there for the first one as we try and set up this series um, and see um, just the beginnings of, of the, the church of Jesus. Uh, also to mention a couple of other things, there's no... Uh, toddler group on Friday because of the school holidays um, and then to mention a couple of other things the fundraising Kaylee on Friday the 24th um, of November uh, there's an opportunity to invite uh, friends and family people from other churches um, and have a really good night all together to enjoy time together and also to raise a wee bit of money um, for the building works coming up um, also to mention the cleaning teams um, so the cleaning teams were set up a few months ago. They're maybe a wee bit depleted now, a couple of people. Um, Ewan very selfishly went to Larbert. Uh, so he's left his cleaning team. Pam's left her cleaning team. Um, there's a couple of other people who were part of cleaning teams who can't do it. So a few of them are depleted. So if you are able to clean the church, it's just uh, once every three months if you're part of one of the cleaning teams. Um, so please uh, speak to Janice if you're able uh, to help out with that. Okay, um, one final thing to mention, if you want to give to the church by uh, cash, then there's wee white boxes um, at the back uh, for you to put your offering. Um, we're going to read the scriptures now. Um, Peter is uh, going to be uh, continuing in our series in the, the book of Revelation, looking at the letters to the churches. And we're in Revelation chapter 1, uh, reading the second half of the chapter. If you're using the Blue Bibles, does anyone, would anyone like a, a church Bible? Hands up if you'd like one. One for Sheila. Anyone else? No. Just Sheila. You're special. Um, um, so if you're using the Blue Bibles, it's on page 1,232. Okay. And I'll read, uh, starting from verse 9. It says there, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned round to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash round his, waist, round his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. 
and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Amen. Um, before we uh, sing and then Peter comes uh, to preach, let's uh, come before the Lord again in prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we read your word, as we read of the exalted Lord Jesus appearing to John, we're just so struck by his majesty that he is the first and the last. He is the living one. That he was once dead because he chose to come to live, to die on the cross so that we could be saved. But that he is now alive again, that he is risen and he has ascended to your right hand where he rules in glory. And Father, we today, as we just think of the brokenness of our world, we long for the day that he returns. We long for the day when he comes back to establish his kingdom in its fullness. That in that day there will be no more mourning or crying or pain because the old order of things will have passed away. Father, we're aware that pain and anguish of life rests upon everyone in different ways. Now there will be people in this room today who are struggling, who just know that the frustration of creation, know the brokenness of our world and brokenness of relationships, and how hard life can be, and we long for Jesus to come back. And we know, Father, that there are those in our community as well that are struggling, whether those who are uh, bound in addiction or in poverty or feel trapped in their lives or are just overcome with loneliness. Father, we ask that you would help us to point them to the Lord Jesus, that we as, as York Evangelical Church would be able to be a light shining in the darkness and proclaiming that Jesus has come uh, to save souls and to bring them into his kingdom, bring them into his light. So Father, please uh, help us uh, to be your witnesses here. But Father, as we think further afield, uh, beyond uh, York or Glasgow or, or even Britain, Lord, we're just aware of the brokenness of our world and especially the many conflicts across our world. And we know that there are uh, hundreds of conflicts that are ripping up people's lives and that our news only covers some of them. But when they do come across our screens, we see the horror of war, the horror of of deep-seated anger and, uh, and bitterness. And we want to bring particularly before you the, the situation in Israel and Gaza, Lord. Father, it's, it's old, it's an old conflict and it's, therefore it's so deeply rooted and deeply held and, and both sides um, suffer and both sides feel such um, pain. Lord, we see uh, across our screens, awful things that human beings are doing uh, to one another. And it, it grieves us and it makes us long uh, for the day when Jesus will return and establish his full peace on the world. But Lord, for now, we ask for your mercy. Uh, Lord, we ask for there to be a quick resolution, as peaceful as possible. Father, we ask for your hand upon it and, and we ask for you to be in the at work in people's lives. For those who don't know you, we ask, Lord, that through this uh, awful situation, you would draw them to know you. 
And Father, we pray particularly for brothers and sisters that are caught up in that conflict and ask, Lord, uh, for you to be near them and help them to strengthen them. And Father, we, as we pray for, for the situation in Gaza, we, we think of the conflicts across our world and, and perhaps there are some that are dear to those who are, who are here. And um, Lord, we ask for your peace. We ask for human beings to be humbled and, and to turn from their sin and their wrath and turn towards you. So, Father, please, would you continue with us? Father, as, as Peter comes to preach, we ask that you would speak through him. We ask that he would help us to see more of Jesus, to see his glory, to see his majesty. Father, we ask that as we look at the scriptures, you would minister to each one of us in the way that you know that we need whether that's teaching or correction or encouragement, be at work among us, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, we're just before Peter comes to preach, we're going to sing uh, number 45 in the hymn books, but it will be on the screen behind me. At your feet we fall and we stand to sing together. <laughs> up, I thought I would introduce him. I know that uh, many of you will know him, but Peter is uh, the associate pastor at Harper Church in Govan, one of the other FIEC churches, which is the group of churches we belong to. Um, and Peter and I meet together for uh, breakfast every Tuesday, um, along with Grant and many others, to uh, pray together, look at the Bible together, and encourage one another. So he's a dear friend, even at half seven in the morning. Um, and uh, it's wonderful to have Peter uh, to come and preach for us from this passage. Let's pray for him just as he comes. 
Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you so much uh, for Peter. We thank you for the gifts that you've given him. We thank you for the ministry that you've called him to. And we ask, Lord, that uh, now as he opens your scriptures for us, we ask that you would speak through him, minister through him to us. Uh, would you bless him as he preaches, and would you bless us? And in all things, would you be glorified? For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm not a morning person, so I don't know how much of a dear friend I am at <laughs> half past seven on a, on a Tuesday. Um, but it's good to be back here. Uh, I'm thankful again for this church and uh, bring greetings from uh, Harper Church, from your brothers and sisters in Christ there. Greg's already prayed for us, so uh, we're going to begin. Uh, you'll perhaps recall King uh, Xerxes in the Old Testament book of Esther. As king of Persia, he was someone with astonishing power and authority. Now, there's a little phrase in the book of Esther that gives us uh, an insight into just how much power he had, uh, the extent of his authority. In chapter 4 of that book, mention is made of the fact that by simply entering the king's presence unannounced could result in your death. It was a punishment. Uh, it could be a punishment by death. It is rarely good news that someone has unchecked power and authority. We know from history, we know from our present day that power and authority can be abused and misused. We are rightly suspicious of those who have too much authority. John, in our passage this morning, sees a vision of the risen, ascended, and reigning Jesus Christ. It is a vision that sets forth Jesus' unquestionable, unrivaled authority and power and majesty. We'll see that John rightly trembles in the presence of such power and authority, but we'll also see that Jesus having this astonishing power an unquestionable authority is in fact good news because it is combined with his goodness. Last week, Greg mentioned that this uh, book, this letter was written to Christians who were struggling. They were suffering persecution to varying degrees. And Greg asked the question, what is it that struggling Christians need what is going to spur them on and help them to persevere? And the answer given was, one, a vision of Jesus, and two, hope for the future. A vision of Jesus, a reminder of who he is, his character, what he has achieved for his people. A right vision of Jesus will ground us, will give us perspective, will encourage, will comfort, will grant peace, will give us joy. And hope for the future will help us to keep going and knowing the future, not every intimate detail, and not knowing the exact timelines, but knowing the final outcome, the reward that is ahead, the destiny of the people of God and the destiny of the wicked will help the struggling Christian to persevere. We need hope. In our passage today, we have both. Uh, we have this awesome vision of Jesus Christ, and we're given hope for the future. Before we get to the vision, we're going to first begin uh, where God's Word does with the situation that John finds himself in. Uh, John in verse 9, look to it again, identifies himself, identifies himself with his audience, uh, those who will hear his letter read out. And he says, I John, your brother. He's writing to his brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, those who, like him, have recognized that Jesus is God's Messiah, God's Christ, God's King, and that Jesus, as this King, has laid down his life for sinners. John has repented of his sin and trusted in Christ for forgiveness and seeks to follow Jesus Christ wholeheartedly as 
Lord, as King. And he's writing to those who have done the same. The church is made up of brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a family. He's writing to his family, to his brothers and sisters. He's writing still in verse 9 as a companion, firstly in the suffering, secondly in the kingdom, and thirdly in the patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. Let's unpack each of those three briefly. He is firstly a companion in the suffering. John's suffering, those he's writing to are suffering. The church will always experience opposition from the world. That opposition will come in ebbs and flows. Um, at times, the world will be more hostile towards the church than at other times. But the normal, everyday experience of the church, from its birth in Acts to the New Testament period, to church history, to the present day, is one of opposition and trial and suffering to varying degrees. John was writing at a time when perhaps that suffering was more prominent uh, or particularly hostile. In fact, as verse 9 goes on to say, he was on the island of Patmos because of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus. For John's faithfulness to God and His Word and his faithfulness to Jesus Christ, he was banished to Patmos. It's an island about 16 square miles. It's off the coast of, to the west of modern-day Turkey, for declaring that Jesus and Jesus alone was king, had landed him most likely in hot water with the Romans. They required that allegiance was sworn to Caesar. John wouldn't do that. He has sworn allegiance to Jesus Christ and him alone. Yet he knows that his citizenship is not one of Patmos because he goes on to say that he is a companion not only in the suffering, but secondly, in the kingdom. His citizenship is not in Patmos, it is in the kingdom of God, which has come with the arrival of Jesus Christ and waits its final consummation when He returns. He might be imprisoned on an island in the middle of the Mediterranean, but that's not where His citizenship is found. It affects not one jot His citizenship. His citizenship is in the kingdom of God. And He is thirdly a companion in the patient endurance Uh, This period of suffering, this banishment to Patmos is a temporary thing. It's temporary. And so he will patiently endure this hardship while remaining in Christ Jesus, knowing that his future is safe and he is secure in God's kingdom, which will one day come in its fullness. Uh, John, in these uh, three little phrases, has described not only his own experience, He's described not only the experience of those he is writing to, he's described the church's experience throughout the ages. If you are a Christian, you will be suffering to some degree for bearing the name of Christ. You are a citizen not of this world, but of God's kingdom. And so you too will be patiently enduring as you wait for God's kingdom in its fullness. The opening phrase in verse 10, look at it with me, is unusual but not unique. John says he was on the Lord's day in the Spirit. In the book of Acts, uh, Peter, didn't he? He had a similar experience in Joppa and received visions from the Lord. Paul too, we can read later in Acts, was in a trance and received instruction from the Lord. Before John sees his vision, he first hears a voice, a loud voice like a trumpet, and the voice tells him to write to these seven churches. And we're going to examine the glorious vision that John turns to see, but before we do, it's worth noting that Jesus is writing to seven churches, seven local congregations. He's not addressing the Roman Empire. He's not speaking to the most influential people of the day, not to the rich, the famous. He's not writing to the nation of Israel, not even the church as a whole as it was in John's day, but rather seven local churches. Never underestimate the importance of the church. Yoker Evangelical Church is significant. 
This is where the worship of the one true God takes place. This is where His people are nurtured and nourished and cared for. This is where God's people are equipped to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. We're going to move on and consider the opening scene of the vision John receives. In verse 12, he turns round in response to the loud trumpet-like voice. And the first thing John sees is seven golden lampstands. And we're told at the end of verse 20 that these lampstands are the seven churches. There's a lampstand for each of Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum and so on. And a lampstand, we do not agree, is an appropriate symbol for the church. Jesus was the light of the world. His people are to shine like stars in a crooked and dark generation. In Israel's tabernacle or temple, there was a sevenfold lamp. The church itself is now meant to be a lampstand, a light, wherever it is located. I do enjoy uh, looking out of the plane window at, at night when, when I'm flying to uh, family in America. And uh, when you look down and you see uh, pockets of light uh, way down below you, it's little villages and towns and cities uh, that are lit up. The local church is supposed to be a pocket of light. It's described as a lampstand. It's supposed to be a pocket of light in a spiritually dark place. In verse 13, someone like a son of man is seen, and you'll know the divine significance of this a title from your recent studies in Daniel, and you'll know too that it was a title Christ used for himself often. This one, like a son of man, can be seen among the lampstands. Again, Christ is with his church, though his people are suffering, as per verse 9. Christ hasn't abandoned his church. He hasn't forsaken his church. He walks in their midst. In the tabernacle, of Israel and later in the temple, it would be the priest that walks among the lampstand, the sevenfold lampstand, and the priest would tend to the lampstand. His job was to keep the oil topped up and to trim the wicks. I think that Christ in this vision has been set forth as the great high priest, the one who refills the churches with oil and tends to their wicks and keeps their flame alight. I look back to our text and you'll see that uh, this one, like a son of man, is dressed, this is still in verse 13, in a robe reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. The priests of Israel were given a, a robe uh, to wear, and mention is made in Exodus of the priest's garment made of golden yarn as along with blue and purple and scarlet. This was for their priestly garments. So again, Christ in this vision has been set forth as the great high priest. And the description in verse 14 is meant to trigger the image of the Ancient of Days. In Daniel chapter 7, Jesus' hair is described as white like wool, as white as snow. It's an image of purity. It's an image of brilliant brightness and majesty. His face was, we're told at the end of verse 16, uh, like the sun shining in all its brilliance. His eyes and feet are also set forth uh, as with brightness and fire and glowing. And John himself, earlier in his life, would you not agree, saw something uh, similar, didn't he? Jesus was transfigured on a mountaintop, and he was shown forth on that occasion, gleaming with light. Uh, John was getting an insight into who Jesus truly is. Look to the end of verse 14. There we see that his eyes were blazing like fire. Uh, this awesome one, like a son of man, listen to this, he sees all things. He has a penetrating gaze. He looks at his church and he can see all that is good about it and all that pleases him and all the ways in which she falls short as the individual letters in Revelation will set forth and you'll see in the weeks to come. Nothing is hidden from his gaze. Friends, Proverbs says that the fear of the Lord 
is the beginning of wisdom. And I think that fear comes in part from knowing that the risen Jesus Christ sees all in all His holiness and all His majesty and all the glory set forth in this vision. He sees all. There is a right and a pleasing fear of God that this should invoke in you and I. Not a fear of condemnation, Christian. Christ has taken our condemnation upon Himself, but a fear of displeasing God. A fear of having to give an account for our lives. A fear of drifting from Him. Verse 15 describes His feet, a bronze glowing as if in a furnace. It's meant to convey power and strength and stability. His voice is described as uh, like the sound of <clears throat> rushing waters. Earlier in the week, my family and I uh, visited a little known waterfall near Livingston. Uh, we could hear it long before we saw it. We actually struggled to find it, but the, the volume, the sheer volume guided us there. The only place where you could see the waterfall was from a position of height. You looked down into the gorge and the waters that were being forced through that gorge were mesmerizing. And the continuous, relentless rushing of waters, pummeling the rocks beneath, created a noise that was breathtaking. You could barely hear a thing. And it caused my four-year-old who's in my arms to cling tightly to me. The voice of the risen ascended and reigning Jesus Christ is like rushing waters. He holds seven stars in his hand according to verse 16 and out of his mouth we have this uh, somewhat, still in verse 16, a uh, awesome picture of a sharp, double-edged sword protruding from his mouth. Swords are for warfare. They're for defending and attacking. And we know that truth, God's word, is the sword. This one, like a son of man, reigns with his sword. He executes judgment with his sword. He advances his kingdom with his sword. He defends his people with his sword, with his powerful words. Christian, never take your uh, personal Bible reading lightly. It wouldn't be a bad exercise, I don't think, uh, for tomorrow morning when you boil the kettle and get your tea or coffee uh, and spend time in God's Word or whenever else in the day it is that you spend time in God's Word uh, to picture this, to see in your mind uh, a sword, a double-edged sword protruding from Christ's mouth and pray in that moment that God would reveal His marvel marvelous truth to you, that He would open His eyes to behold wondrous things, that He would cause your heart to burn within and that the Spirit would help you to be doers of the Word and not hearers. So this is the vision John sees. It's marvelous. It's awe-inspiring. It's glorious. This is the Jesus we worship. This is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the great high priest, unrivaled in majesty, unrivaled in power and authority and glory. John, suffering for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, receives this vision. And do you not think that all his sufferings will have faded into the background at that moment? A Christian, when you face trials, uh, when you go through suffering, when you're just weary looking out at the world and the mess that it's in and the suffering that is out there, uh, turn to this vision of the reigning Jesus Christ and meditate on it. When the Christian struggles, they need a vision of Jesus. We're going to move on and we're going to look at the impact the vision had on John. And you'll see the impact it had on John in verse 17. Uh, the text says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Yeah, this is John's response. And John has an entirely correct and right response. He has received a vision of awesome majesty and awesome glory, of unquestionable power and brilliant holiness and falling down as though dead is a good and right response. It won't have been a conscious response, not something that John 
thought through and made a decision to do, the vision of Jesus will have simply caused him to fall down. And this is not a unique response. It's not a unique episode. When we read of people in the Bible encountering the supernatural, it causes men and women to tremble. And Peter fell to his knees and he cried out to Jesus, away from me for I am a sinful man, after Jesus had revealed his power by leading Peter to a miraculous catch of fish. Isaiah, when he catches a glimpse of the heavenly throne room in, in a vision, cries out, woe is me for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the king the lord of hosts ezekiel receives a vision of god's throne room and all that surrounds that throne and he fell down on his face in the weeks to come you'll see in revelation chapter 4 and 5 a vision of the throne room of god and there we see creatures and angels falling down and bowing and worshiping christian your god is an awesome god an almighty God, a God whose presence would cause you and I to tremble. Scripture makes clear that every knee will bow before Jesus. And such is simply a natural effect of being in His presence. Now, as I said at the beginning, being in the presence of awesome power and majesty and glory uh, to the extent that it causes you to fall down as though dead, is not necessarily a good thing in of itself. It's only a good thing if the person with that power and that authority is good. And look at what Jesus did and what he spoke in verse 17. He placed his right hand on John, and I presume that was to comfort him and strengthen him. And look at his words. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. You have no need to fear me. I am the one who said I am gentle and lowly. A bruised reeds I will not break. A smoldering wick I will not quench. If you belong to me, if you are my disciple, if you have repented of sin and placed your faith in me, do not be afraid. Yes, I am Lord. Yes, I am a king, the king of kings. Yes, I have eyes that blaze like fire, but I'm also your savior. I'm also your brother. I'm also your friend. Do not be afraid. Jesus continues in verse 17. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. How epic, how epic are Jesus' words. Jesus Christ has conquered death. He went toe to toe with death and death lost. He rose victorious to die no more. He lives forever and ever. I was dead, but behold, but look, I am alive. Christians that are struggling and suffering and weary need a vision of Jesus and they need hope. We've had the vision and here is the hope. The great enemy death, the indiscriminate enemy death, the opponent whose victims who can count has been defeated. And the risen, ascended and reigning Jesus Christ in all his glory, the one who says, do not be afraid, now holds the keys of death and Hades. The Christian need not, need not fear death. Upon death, the Christian soul goes to be with the Lord, which is better by far, and they await their resurrected bodies, which they will enjoy forever and ever. They will rise to die no more. Well, Jesus continues to speak in verses 19 and 20, and interprets the vision for John, and we're going to close by looking at the interpretation. Uh, Jesus commands John, verse 19, to write down uh, the vision, which is for two time periods, uh, that which John is presently in, what is now, and that which will happen sometime in the future relative to when John uh, sees the vision, that which will take place later. And this is the book of Revelation. It contains visions for John's age, 
which we can still apply to the life of the church today, like we do with the rest of Scripture, and writings about the future. And Jesus gives the interpretation for the stars and the lampstands, the seven stars are the seven angels. You might have a footnote in your Bible which says that messenger is an appropriate translation for angel. And so we have these seven messengers or these seven angels, or at least three possibilities for the identity of the angel or messenger. Now, some think it is a human messenger delivering the letter, but I tend to think there would be one human messenger leaving Patmos. Perhaps he'll have a traveling companion, and he will go around all the seven churches. So I don't think it's seven human messengers that will be leaving Patmos. It could be referring to a leader who will read out the letter assigned to that church, uh, the letters to the individual churches that come in chapter 2 onwards. The leader will at that moment become God's messenger to the church. The third option is that each church has an angel who watches over that church. That'd be a nice thought, wouldn't it, that there would be an angel looking over each of the church. But each letter in chapter 2 onwards starts with the words, to the angel in the church of such and such, Ephesus, Pergamum, write. My question would be, why would John write to an angel? So which option will we go for? Well, I'm going to let Greg or whoever is preaching next week uh, provide you with a correct answer. Uh, so come back next week to find out. Now, the seven lampstands in verse 20 are simply the seven churches, the churches located in each of these cities. Uh, friends, here is our closing thought for today. Well, there might be a little ambiguity with the identity of the angels, and what is not ambiguous is Christ's concern for the church. The risen, ascended, and reigning Jesus Christ in all His fearful glory is concerned with laser focus on the local church. He walks among the lampstands, that is the churches. He holds the church's angel or messenger in His hand. He writes to the churches through John. Jesus Christ is concerned with, has set his sight upon, walks in the midst of the church. The world thinks that governments and corporations and the United Nations and the powerful and the wealthy and all that looks and sounds impressive is where it's at. But in actual fact, the one who has eyes that blaze like fire the one who is a sword protruding from his mouth, the one who holds the keys to death and Hades, the one who was dead but lives forevermore, he is concerned with the local church. He's concerned with Yoker, evangelical church. And that, this, is where it's at. Let's be encouraged and let's pray together. Lord God and Heavenly Father, thank you for this vision of uh, the risen, ascended, and reigning Jesus Christ that John received. Thank you for its glory and its majesty, its power. We praise and worship Jesus Christ in all his glory. And Lord God, when we struggle, uh, bring to mind this passage of Scripture and cause us to dwell upon it. Thank you, Lord God, that you have given us great reason to hope. Uh, we worship one <clears throat> who reigns, who has conquered death, who lives to never die again. And thank you that in Christ, uh, this is our hope, that we will one day be with our King, that we will see him face to face, and that we will uh, live to die no more. Lord God, thank you for Christ's concern for the church, that he walks in her midst, that he has set his sight upon her. Uh, Lord God, help us to be encouraged by this truth and to commit to the local church uh, to work for her good and her prospering in this world. Uh, Lord God, bless us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to close by singing a hymn together, Thine Be the Glory. Let me invite you to stand when the music starts. Oh.